You may all be seated. Hey, good morning, Regeneration Church. I am not here with you today, um, so thus the video. I'm in Gilroy. Uh, there is a pastor there, Justin Richter, who took over for me when I left to come here. And uh, he is turning over the church to another friend of mine named Nick Lamau. I know both of these men well, and so I'm part of their service today, um, helping with that baton transfer. And, and Bill Holdridge is here to teach. And I'm excited because he had so much of an impact on our church in Gilroy. When we planted the church there, uh, we came out of Calvary Chapel San Jose and Don McClure was just 40 miles up the road. I was excited about having, having him close by. And then he moved and I thought, I need a mentor. I need someone that could coach me and pour into my life. So I asked Bill Holdridge to come out to our church. I asked him to meet with our people, ask any question, go to any of our meetings, um, just do a really uh, intense look at what we're doing and where we could grow and where we could get better. And I was able to ask good questions and get good answers. And so a lot of the health of that time um, remained at the church in Gilroy, and I brought over here to Regeneration Church. Now, some of you know Pastor Bill well because he pastored Regeneration Church, Calvary Chapel, Santa Cruz, before I came for a couple of years, and uh, didn't know that he was in that transitional senior pastoring, but then made it, the Lord made it clear that he had another assignment, Poiman Ministry, for uh, Pastor Bill, and so I'm excited that on this day that I'm over in Gilroy that Bill Holdridge is here to teach you today. So please welcome uh, with a warm welcome and with your prayers, Pastor Bill Holdridge. Man, <laughs> Matt made me cry. Such a good brother, such a wonderful pastor, and uh, great to be here. My wife isn't here with me. On this trip, she's taking care of our new dog. <laughs> we love dogs. So if you're a dog lover, you love me because we love dogs. <laughs> Would you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians. We're going to read our text together. I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, if you have another version, then that's fine. We're not going to read out loud. I'll read out loud. You follow along. If you would, and if you are able, please stand and join me in the reading of God's Word. Chapter 4, verses 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself... gave some to be apostles some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children 
tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Thank you, Lord, for blessing the reading of your word. And now, Lord, our hearts are open to what it says, what it means, and how it applies to us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of this message is, How Do We Hit What We Are Supposed to Be Aiming At? How do we hit what we are supposed to be aiming at? And I'm talking about the church. How does the church hit what it's supposed to be aiming at? How do we as individual members of the body of Christ hit what we're supposed to be aiming at? And so that's the idea that we're going to be addressing in our text. Now, before we can aim at anything, we have to know what the target is. And the target is clear in scripture. No church on the planet has to invent their own target, what to aim at. Because it's clear in scripture. We have the targets. Let's put them in the plural, the targets. First of all, the great commandments. And then secondly, the great commission. Those are the targets. When churches are seeking to figure out what their vision is, this is it. This is the vision of every biblical church that is on the planet. Any deviation from this vision is simply kind of making it up as we go or doing it the way we want to do it. Now, the the mission of the church is, is different than the vision. The vision is clear. It's the great commandments and the great commission. The mission the way that's implemented, uh, the, the field that is addressed, that can change and vary from fellowship to fellowship, but the, the targets are the same for every church, or should be. The great commandments. It was what Jesus told the lawyer who had tested Jesus with a question that he thought would perplex Jesus. He said, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you know this, uh, all of you know these commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is what it's about. Supreme love for God and loving others in the same way that we already love ourselves. That's the idea. Those are the great commandments. And then we have the great commission given to his disciples after uh, his, uh, or his ascension or his resurrection from the dead and before he ascended into heaven. He told his men, the ones he'd been training for three plus years. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So making disciples, before a disciple can be made, a conversion must occur, so this includes preaching the gospel as well. So the preaching of the gospel, which leads to conversions, which now leads to making them into disciples. A disciple is a close follower who learns from Jesus. That's what a disciple is. Someone who denies himself or herself, takes up the cross, to follow him, that's what a disciple is. So we are to make disciples of the nations, baptizing them, which is the outward demonstration of the faith that we've expressed in believing the gospel message, and then uh, baptizing them, and then teaching them, notice this, to observe all things that I've commanded you. Not necessarily teaching them what 
I've commanded you primarily, just like giving a message like this is what Jesus said, but actually teaching people to observe it, getting this into them, into behaviors and into actions and into words and the way we actually treat other people and the way we actually live our lives as close followers of Christ. That's what Jesus commanded his disciples to do is to put this stuff into people. And that's what the church is. The church is this kind of an environment where these kinds of things occur. So that's, those are the targets. We're always aiming at those targets the great commandments, and the great commission. And we have to adjust from time to time because our sights on our rifles or on our bows get a little wonky and you know, we have to adjust the sights. And so, but we're always aiming at the same target, no matter uh, what. And so we have to always come back to these things. So those are the targets. So how is the church to hit? these targets, and that's what Ephesians chapter four, verses one through 16 addresses. How are we to hit those targets? And there's a place for all of this with you and me, by the way, we're gonna get to what does this matter to me? But the, pa- the passage that we just read is broken into three sections. The unity of the body of Christ is given us in verses one through six. And then Christ's gifts to his church are described in verses seven through 11. And then the purpose of those gifts to his church is described in verses 12 through 16. So the unity of the body of Christ, there's a unity. And it's based around seven aspects of our unity. We're one body, we're one, there's one spirit, one Holy Spirit, there's one hope of eternal life, there's one Lord Jesus Christ, there's one faith or body of doctrine which we are to be believing in as essentials to the faith. There's one baptism or entrance into this kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. And there is one God and Father who is the Father of all believers, making every true believer part of his family, that's our unity. And to put it in a different way, you remember when Jesus prayed his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. He prayed before his father, and the first thing he prayed was that the father would glorify him, that he might glorify the father. And so that was the first part of his prayer. And then he prayed for his disciples that he had worked with for three plus years, that he would, that the Father would keep them, that the Father would sanctify them through the truth, that the Father would bless them and give them the influence that they were to have because everything was hedging around these men and how well they did. So he prayed for his disciples directly. And then he prayed for another group, those who would come to faith in Christ through the disciples. Now you have to watch me and to see what I'm doing here, to understand what Jesus prayed. He prayed for his disciples, the ones who he had trained, and then he prayed for all of those throughout all of the centuries that would believe in Jesus through the ultimate witness of the disciples, that they would be one. That who would be one? That the disciples, you and me, and all subsequent and preceding generations would be one with the apostles. That our faith would be like their faith. They were the best church. The apostolic first century church was by far the best church. It was the foundational church. And our task is to be one with them. And that's why this description is given here in verses one through six. It describes the unity of the body of Christ. It's the unity that we have because we're in line with the understanding of the faith that the apostles had. That's what we're, we don't look around at other churches and say, well, you know, they got this thing going on, they got that thing going on, they got this bell, they got that whistle, so let's do that and let's have, we'll have unity. Well, that might have its place, But the ultimate unity, the most important unity, is how closely aligned are we with the first century New Testament apostolic church? How much are we like them? 
And that's what Jesus is praying for and still, I believe, as our great high priest is praying for. And then in verses seven through 11, Christ's gifts to his church. Uh, the, The text reads this way, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. He ascended on high, led captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. So this grace that has been given us according to the measure of Christ's gift comes in the form of spiritual giftings and the power to be Christ's witnesses and to exercise those gifts. These are things that Jesus gave his church. He gave his church spiritual gifts, spiritual giftings, and the power to live the Christian life, to be his witnesses, and the power to exercise those gifts. What an exciting thing. Did you know when you were born again that you had already been bequeathed gifts or gift of the Spirit given by Jesus directly, and that you can discover what your plan is, what his plan is for you, and your purpose here on this planet according to the Lord Jesus Christ, which completely can reshape the whole function, direction, and focus of a life. I had no idea when I was converted what that was gonna mean. Very few did. What I needed the most was forgiveness. And what I needed the most was the power to be able to live differently. Neither of which did I have, both of which I needed, and the Lord has been very gracious to provide that as often as needed over the years. Praise the Lord for that. But what I didn't know was that my future was gonna be reshaped. The direction I had in terms of lifestyle, plan of action, uh, career, all those kinds of things, was nothing uh, like what ended up happening. (laughs) And I was as surprised as anybody else when the Lord changed my direction. And these are things that have come to us through Christ. And he has given gifts to his church. Four, nine, and 10 tells us that he ascended, and I'm reading from the ESV, which I think is probably a better translation of the phrase. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, into the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So these gifts that Jesus has given to the church are very much connected with the incarnation of Christ and connected with his exaltation. He came to be one of us, his incarnation. Incarnation means in flesh. He took upon himself a body. He took upon himself humanity. And he still is, by the way, fully man as well as being fully God. He was not fully man before the incarnation. He was only the eternal son of God. As if that was, it's not an only, but I mean, that's what he was, nothing else. But then he added a nature. He added a human nature and lived in a human body as a man, and he was raised as a man glorified and ascended to the right hand of the Father as a man glorified, where he still is the God-man. And therefore, he is able to sympathize with us because he understands what it means to be a human being. And so we know he understands when we pray. And we know that being God, he's got the power to do something about what he understands about us. And it's wonderful. I mean, it's just an incredible thing. How do we know that he's still a man as well as the eternal son of God? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but... One of the clearest is in 1 Timothy 2.5. There is one God, that passage tells us, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is, present tense, clearly, still a man. The God-man, fully God, fully man. 
That's the mystery of the incarnation. And this God-man came into this new category of being the God-man through his incarnation, being born of the Virgin Mary, and then living the life that he lived as a sinless man in dependence upon his father. And this is what Paul writes about in Philippians, the second chapter, in verses two through, or five through six, again in the ESV, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So eventually he was raised, of course, and eventually he was exalted to the right hand of the Father, and as that happened, he prayed to his father, we know from John 14, and asked the father to send the Holy Spirit to empower his people as the body of Christ. And Jesus had told his disciples, I'm not gonna leave you without help. I'm not gonna leave you comfortless. I wanna come to you. How did he come to us? He came to us by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, identified as such in Romans chapter eight. The Spirit of Christ is Jesus coming to us in invisible form by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. And Jesus said, I'm gonna do that for you. And he had told them that um, the helper, when he does come, he will do this and that for you. And You're not gonna be alone. I'm gonna send, he said, another helper, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. It doesn't see him, doesn't know him, but you know him because he dwells with you and he shall be in you. And you may not know this, but when he said, I'm gonna send, I'm I'm gonna ask the Father and he's gonna send to you another helper, it's very clear from use of the Greek term what he was talking about. Because he could have used the Greek word that meant another of a different kind as me. But he didn't use that Greek word. He used the Greek word that means another of the same kind as me. Not heteros, but alos is the Greek word that he used. In other words, I'm gonna pray to the Father. The Father is gonna send to you a helper, the spirit of truth, the spirit of the living God, and he's gonna be just like me. The only difference is he's gonna be invisible. When you're driving down the road and you're needing protection from the crazies that are driving around on the road with you, you know who's sitting shotgun with you, right? You know who's living inside of you, right? It's the Holy Spirit of the living God and you know who he is? He's Jesus in invisible form. And he's there all the time and he's watching and he's helping. You're in a tight spot, you don't know what to do. Somebody asks you a question, you don't know what to say. Guess what? The Spirit of God is right there available. He's willing to have a conversation with you and wants you to have a conversation with him and he's the one that is gonna give you the wisdom that you need when you depend upon him for that specific situation. Lord, I'm going into this opportunity It's way too much for me. I don't have it in me to fulfill this opportunity. I don't know what to do. I don't know how how I'm gonna be able to do this. The Spirit of God living within us, right next to us, constantly available to us, the helper. It's just like Jesus was there with us in physical, visible form, but it's not Jesus in physical, visible form. It's Jesus in invisible, non-physical form in the person of the Holy Spirit of God, who is the helper just like him. And that's our power. That's our resource. That's our wisdom. That's our gifting. That's our strength. That's our opportunity. So nobody is disqualified from being vital. Nobody's disqualified from being important in the kingdom. No one's disqualified because of their own weakness. In fact, the greater the weakness, the more opportunity for God's strength to be made perfect in us. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. So these uh, things are so important for us to know. The church, 
needed Pentecost, by the way, did it not? Notice that Jesus said to his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Don't try to do anything these next 10 days. Don't try to fulfill the Great Commission, not yet. You need Pentecost. You need the Spirit to come upon you and give you the power that I have promised will come to you. And so they obediently waited in Jerusalem and they did the wise thing. They had a prayer meeting that lasted 10 days. And they just waited. And then when the day of Pentecost fully came, the Spirit came upon the church and they had power that they had never had before. And the same Peter that was there on the night that Jesus was betrayed and was denying that he even knew who the Lord was three times. That same Peter was standing up in front of thousands of people and saying, he whom you delivered up and crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. He had the boldness and power to say something that he couldn't have said pre-Pentecost because of the Holy Spirit. And what happened in Peter was multiplied in the other disciples and is available for you and for me because of the ascension and exaltation of Christ. So the church needed Pentecost. Without Pentecost, there would have been no church. It would have been like the greatest firecracker you could have invented and the fuse gets lit but then it just goes and nothing happens. <laughs> it would have been a big flat dud without the Holy Spirit. The church would have been a big fat dud. But every believer also needs his or her own Pentecost. We all need to be empowered as witnesses of Christ. So I knew it was inevitable that I was gonna follow Jesus. I did. And the reason I knew that is because in 1969, there was an invitation at the very first Calvary Chapel. Pastor Chuck was preaching. Lonnie Frisbee was preaching that night. I'd never been to a Protestant church before. I thought it was a sin to be. I thought I'd go to hell by going to a Protestant church. <laughs> but I went to that Protestant church because a bunch of my friends had been going to that Protestant church and getting saved radically and started bringing their Bibles to high school. I was a junior in high school in 1969. You'll do the math later. <laughs> and so I wanted to figure out, what are these guys into? I'm supposed to be the spiritual guy around here. I'm the one that goes to church every Sunday. Not. <laughs> but I mean, kind of. So I went, and it blew me away never experienced the moving of the Spirit of God like I did that night. And when the invitation was given and the gospel had been presented, I never knew the things that I'd heard that night, that Jesus actually went to the cross on purpose. It was mandated by and directed by God the Father himself Jesus went to the cross in purpose, on purpose. He died intentionally to pay for the sins of the entire world, including mine. And that by receiving him, I could know tonight, I was told, that I had eternal life. I'd never heard that message before. It was amazing. So they wanted to know, who wants to receive this? I... I shot my hand up. I don't know if I was first in the room to get my hand up, but I did. I shot my hand up, went for it and got prayer, and my life did change. But I was eventually doing stuff in my own strength, and, you know, like a, a good firecracker that fizzled out, that was me. I fizzled out. And it was about three and a half years later, and the Lord, you know, he had me on the line. The hook was set. There was no getting off the hook. And he was just reeling slowly. 
And I'm getting closer and closer to the boat, and then finally I was at the bottom of my barrel and at the end of my rope. And I knew that the inevitable day had come, time to be a follower of Jesus. How am I gonna do this? Really? How am I gonna do this? I've tried in the last several years to do this from time to time, and I had failed every single time, flat on my face, I had no confidence at all in myself. And so when that evening came and it was time for me to pray and again, make a commitment of my life to Christ, this is what I prayed. I don't remember the exact words, but this is exactly the gist of what I prayed. Lord, I know it's time for me to follow you and to live for you with everything. But I failed. If you will give me the willingness to follow you, I will. And if you'll give me the power to follow you, I will. And all I can say is that there was an explosion in my spirit that happened. And I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that was called, what I was experiencing, but that's what it was. And it was only later in reading through the New Testament, starting to get grounded in the Word, that I stumbled across Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Philippians 2, 12 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is God who works in you, both to will or want to, and to do his good pleasure. God is gonna give you the willingness, it's his willingness, and he's gonna give you the power to carry out anything he has called you to be and do. I didn't know that verse was in the Bible when I prayed that night, but the truth was there all the time and I didn't know it. I've been running on those fumes for 51 years. (laughs) Have you ever been in a place where you just don't have any willingness anymore? You're out of willpower and you're out of willingness. In fact, you're not even sure if you want to be made willing. And even stepping back from that, you're not even sure if you want to be made wanting to be willing. (laughs) (laughs) But you just go back to the scriptures, like I have so many times. Lord, willingness comes from you. Motivation comes from you. Power and strength comes from you. I'm trusting you to give me willingness again. I've never, ever experienced the Lord saying no to that prayer. He answers it every time, and I'm infused with a new, fresh heart full of willingness. I think you can relate. Verses seven through 12 goes on to talk about uh, the fact that some of Christ's gifts to the church are actually called, prepared, and gifted men. And that's what verse 11 says. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Christ gave these called and gifted and prepared men to the church. We'll find out why in a moment, but he did it. He prepared them, he called them, he equipped them, and then he gave them to the church as gifts to the church, human beings that are gifts to the church. They're identified in this passage as apostles and as prophets, evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. There's a question about whether this is referring to five kinds of men, or offices perhaps, or four. One 
train of thought says that the pastor, pastors and teachers ought to be translated pastor-teacher as it refers to one individual. And I think there's an argument for that that can be made, especially from the original language. But be that as it may, whether there are four or five, what the important thing is, is what do these men do? What did the apostles do? Well, they went out and they were sent out because that's what the word apostle means, one who is sent out. They were sent out to go to places and start stuff, start churches, ordain elders, and then move on to another location. Now, there was only one group of foundational apostles for the church, and that would be the first century New Testament apostles. And the church is built upon the foundation of those apostles and those prophets that were in the first century. Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. So we know that from Ephesians 2.20. There are apostolic type ministries today. In fact, I just had a conversation last week with a, a, a brother that is uh, an amazing missionary He's heading to India and then to uh, Nepal, and he's gonna be going up into these regions in the Himalayas where he doesn't even know if there's ever been someone from the West that's ever been there. But he knows about some people groups up there and he wants to start a work and see what God wants to do. He's just got that apostolic, I'm being sent kind of an attitude and that mentality. The prophets are the ones who don't necessarily predict the future, you may or may not know this, but most prophecy in the Bible isn't predictive. Most prophecy in the Bible is just speaking the mind of God, the heart of God to a current situation. So the prophets do that. They, they shape things by direct words from the Holy Spirit that help us understand what this means, what we're to do, how, how the direction should go in this thing. So the prophets were important. There still are prophets today, and the gift of prophecy, of course, is available in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 tells us about that. Then there are the evangelists. The evangelists are the ones, of course, that not only preach the gospel, but remember, they're part of this equipping team. So evangelists actually help equip others to do the work of an evangelist. So they're preaching the gospel, but they're also equipping believers for the preaching of the gospel through their example and through their training. And then the pastor teachers, their, their work is to shepherd the body of Christ. They stay at home most of the time. And they're there teaching and, and uh, helping to form local congregations of believers. So their role is identified in total in verse 12. Their role is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the, gospel, uh, the body of Christ. What is the purpose of these men given in verse 11? The apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, if you're a, a true believer in Jesus here this morning, or watching online, you are the subject of the ministry of these five offices. What does it mean to be equipped? Well, the, the actual word translated equipping here comes from a verb which means to mend or repair uh, to make something that is broken whole again, like the mending of broken bones. That's one aspect of the meaning of the word. And the other aspect of the meaning of the word means to enable something to be adequate and sufficient for a task. So putting it together, uh, to equip means to mend or repair human lives through the grace of God, the ministry of the Spirit, the Word of God, and so on, but also to equip them, to help them become sufficient for something, that they might be able to fulfill the purpose for which they were created. That's what these equipping ministries are for, is that we might be fixed, broken things might be mended, 
but also that we might become sufficient for something that the Lord has called and designed for us to become. And he's got a plan for every single one of us in this room. A very specific plan that's in his mind. And it's understood in the rearview mirror. (laughs) But it's something that unfolds over time. So that's the, that's the purpose of these gifts that are mentioned in verse 11. I, I scratch my head at the seeming confusion in so many parts of the body of Christ concerning these fundamental, very clear principles in Scripture. I mean, losing the idea of the great commandments and the great commission. Where, how did we lose that? How did, how did the church become something that was a place where people have their needs met primarily instead of an equipping environment or uh, an environment where we're getting trained to become what we're supposed to become in Christ? When did that happen? As Dave Johnston, who was the pastor of Calvary Chapel Santa Cruz before it became regeneration, before I came along, he used to say, why are there so many sermonettes for Christianettes? (laughs) Being introduced uh, before the congregation. I don't understand it. I don't understand how we can miss the great commandments and miss the great commission and then miss the purpose uh, of the church, how we fulfill the great commandments and the great commission. So the equipping of the saints. So the way to become equipped is very clear. And I'm gonna run through this quickly. First of all, we're equipped by the word of God. We need to learn the word of God. We need to learn not just verses, but learn what the Bible actually teaches. the message of the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is our text for this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scripture equips us. And that was the reason why I failed when I first accepted Christ and my faith was about as uh, shallow as it could be. I didn't get into the word. Second time around, I got into the word and began reading the Bible for myself. And I found and do find, as do you, that the scripture equips us. When we're off base, it reproves us. After we've been reproved, the scripture corrects us. It trains us in living a righteous life that pleases God. And it gives us what is called here completion or completeness as we've been equipped for every good work. The word there, complete, is mature, of a full age. That's what the scripture does. We're also equipped through biblical fellowship. In 1 John chapter one, John writes about the fact that they had been speaking to them, they'd been writing to them about the Lord Jesus. We write these things to you that you might have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. Biblical fellowship is absolutely mandatory in fulfilling the plan that God has for our lives. And and one of the reasons for that is that it's only in the context of biblical fellowship that we learn what we've been given. I remember the first group I got involved with. It was a Christian commune up in Boise, Idaho. And even then, they they were starting to identify some tendencies that I had. You like to do this, you like to do that, you seem to be good at this. And then I joined another small group that actually was about a, it was 100 people in a small group in a home Bible study. I was part of that group. And 
I thought, I'm just going to take it upon myself that any person that walks in the door, and I don't know their name, I'm going to learn their name, and I'm going to find out where they're at with Jesus and if they need any help. And I didn't know what that was called. Later on, I, was found, out, I found out that that was called pastoring. <laughs> I didn't know what that was called. And then I just had a desire. The things I was learning, I wanted to tell people about it. And so I was given an opportunity. Somebody said, well, you seem to be able to explain answers to questions every once in a while pretty well. So can you lead the communion devotion next week? And I discovered that, man, this teaching thing is pretty cool. I, I love doing this. I love studying. I love the preparation. I love, I love how the Lord just beats me up one side and down the other as I study the passage, you know, and I really, I have to, it grinds me. <laughs> you know, I get changed by the, the scriptures I'm studying, you know, in a good way. And I need it. And, but that wouldn't have happened without biblical fellowship. If I was an island, that's about as far as I'd get. It's just being me, myself, and I on an island. But with people, you discover these things. You discover the gifts. And then we're equipped by the Holy Spirit. We've already talked about that, where Jesus said he's going to send another helper that he may abide with you forever. And of course, we're also equipped in prayer. An example of that is this short quote from what we call the Lord's Prayer. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I mean, the resource of prayer... I'll just say this about prayer, and I'm not going to belabor this, but do not let prayer be an obligation and a responsibility to you. Let it be an invitation and an opportunity, because that's what prayer is. It's an invitation by the living God. You can come into my presence at any time, as often as you want to, and dwell with me and I with you. That's what prayer is. We can talk about all of these things. That ha- and I can direct my resources through your life through answered prayer. And I can affect nations, and I can affect families, and I can affect churches through you, through prayer. What an opportunity. And I know, you know there are some great books on prayer that are out there. And I used to read the older alt- authors that were writing on prayer. <laughs> And a couple of the first ones were heavy, really heavy, full of truth, full of good things. But the way I was hearing, hear, hear, hearing it was, as I read it, was I am a huge failure because I don't pray like that. I don't pray as long as that. I don't pray exactly like that. I must not even matter. And the Lord showed me, you know what? You have got to learn how to read these things differently. You've got to learn how to read it through the lens and the filtering of the Holy Spirit and the the truth of the whole of the word of God. And I've discovered that prayer is an invitation of the living God. He invented it so that he could have human beings draw near to him and be part of him as often as possible. And I could go on and on on that subject, but each congregant then must learn and grow and discover not only how to pray, but discover their giftings and become more and more mature in character. So that leads us to the purpose of Christ's gifts to the church. The first is given us in verse 13, unity, coming into the unity of the faith in line with the apostles, coming into a true knowledge of Jesus Christ, an experiential knowledge, Coming into spiritual maturity, which is the perfect man phrase. It means of a full age. Maturity that is like Christ. In other words, the purpose is like what I used to tell my kids when they were in the home. My son's now, what is he? He's 45. My daughter's 42. But when they were little, I used to tell them, your responsibility in life is very simple. It's to grow up. Because you're going to be 18, and, eventually, and that's going to mean you're an adult. In the culture and in this family, you're going to be an adult when you're 18. That's going to be your bar mitzvah and your bat mitzvah when you're 18 years of age. 
So you not you got to grow up. You got some learning to do to prepare for 18. And that's what the Lord is saying to us. We need to grow up. But how do we grow up and what does it look like when we grow up? We grow up into Christ. We become like him. In verse 14, there's the other aspects of what all this is about. And we learn that we're no longer to be babies. That is infants, unable to speak. That's what the word is. We're not to be simple-minded any longer. People that are just tossed around by false doctrine. Why is there false doctrine anyway? Why are there places where false teachers can gather massive amounts of people and persuade them? Well, the reason for false teachers is the market for them. There are a lot of itching ears. And because of the existence of a lot of itching ears, there are a lot of false teachers because they can profit pretty nicely plying their trade. But we're not to be like that. And then in verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Growing up, speaking the truth in love. Truth without love is brutality. Love without truth is sentimentality. So we need truth and love to do this right. And this is all part of the maturation process of the believers and the body. And then in verse 16, everyone connected to everyone, every single person doing his or her share, then the church body grows. Okay, so, conclusion. One of the great problems in the visible church today is that there are large amounts of people who do not become equipped and ready for ministry, although that's the implied responsibility of every congregant, to become equipped and ready for ministry. And because they do not become equipped and ready for ministry, they're not ready for ministry and they're not looking for opportunities to minister. And so, because of that, they're not aiming at the targets the Lord Jesus has given us, the great commandments and the great commission, and there's no motivation to change. They've settled. They've settled. They'd settled for a version of Christianity which is not Christianity at all. It's churchianity or Christendom, but it's not the real thing. It's not the New Testament idea of what it, it's like to be a participatory member of the body of Christ. So what can be done about this? And you know what? For any of those that are in the five offices mentioned in verse 11, the answer is nothing. They can do nothing about that except for try to make an attempt to equip. But where do you, you can't produce the want to in someone, and you can't, can't produce the power in someone. That has to come from within the individual. And maybe you're here this morning and you, you're not involved with anything, you haven't grown, you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, maybe you're a new believer, that's gonna come. But maintain a passion to figure out why am I here on planet Earth, what is my role in the body of Christ, what is my role in the kingdom? And once you get that inside of you, once you get that passion inside of you, then go to the Lord with, with Philippians 2.13 in mind and realize he will give you the motivation and he'll sustain that motivation and he'll give you the power to do it. We need to become equipped and then from that we can do what we need to do in the plan of God for our lives and corporately, collaboratively as a church. That's the way it grows. And what the Lord is doing here at Regeneration Church is is wonderful, special. Pastor Matt tells me about uh, some of the the wonderful, beautiful, fragrant breezes that are blowing through the church that are becoming stronger breezes. They're becoming winds, and they're becoming stronger winds in certain places. But you know what? We keep doing this thing. 
the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry until when? The text tells us, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Until we're all there, we keep going until we're all there. As far as I know, we're not all there. (laughs) Present in many cases, but not accounted for. That's it. That's it. The equipping of the saints. Now, there is the responsibility for the equippers. And you're in a great church when that church helps you find the places where you can fit. And it just thrills me to be here this morning. It's just thrilled. Because I'm watching all these people doing all these different things. Lots of people doing all kinds of different things. And I can tell by the way they're doing the things they're doing that they're equipped for it, they're wired for it, and they're good at it. That's a blessing. So we keep doing this equipping thing and getting equipped until everybody is on that page. And I don't think that's happened yet, that everybody's on that page. But we're getting there, right? We're getting there. That's the message. The worship teachers, or worship, worship teachers, worship team can come up. We'll close. Oh, I wish I could be with you for hours and hours and hours on these things. And you're thinking, I'm hungry, it's time for lunch. (laughs) I get it. But Lord, we thank you for your plan for us. It's quite amazing what you've given us. Even to do anything for you and by you is such an incredible supernatural event and so unexpected by us, at least at first. But for you to take us, what we were, bring us into faith in Christ, deposit into us a deposit of yourself and the gifts that are part of you, and then to use us in these ways, and we didn't see it coming. And we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. And we pray, Lord, that your church would be like the one described in verse 16 of this passage. According to the effective working by which every part does its share, provides an increase for your glory. And as we're praying, if you're, maybe you're in that place where you say, you know what? I've, I don't know what my part is and I don't know what the gifts are that God has given me. I haven't really had an interest in that. It hasn't really been my focus, but I do know that I'm a Christian. Can I just share with you very bluntly, you need to repent. Repentance means to change your mind to the point where your life is changed. You need to get serious and say, Father, For some reason or another, I haven't even started the journey to figure out why I'm here. I've just been content with something much less. Change your mind about that. That's not an acceptable condition. And determine to find out through these means of equipping that we've talked about, the Word of God, fellowship, prayer, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, determined to find out and don't let the Lord go until you begin to discover it. And if you don't have any hunger for it, go to him and ask him for the hunger. And if you don't have any power for it, go to him and ask him for the power. Say, Lord, I'm changing my mind. I'm changing my mind right now, sitting here right now, Standing here right now, I'm changing my mind about the way I've been thinking about church, 
about what it means to be a Christian, about what it means to be part of the body of Christ. I want to be in line with you, Lord. I turn away from any form of Christianity which is not consistent with the New Testament. Teach me, Lord. I turn away from apathy, which is eating my soul. I turn to you, Lord. You're the one who works in us to will and to do of your good pleasure. Make a decision now, and you know what? As you're beginning to act on that decision, go to one of the pastors, one of the elders here at the church and let them know because they're here to help equip you. Let them know what's going on inside of you. Tell them who you are if they don't know you and tell them what's going on in your life. And they can be part of the process for you to become the one that God has called you to become. Maybe you've been around for a long time and you know very well, but you're getting a little bit older and you're thinking, I don't know if I'm vital anymore. Well, that's nonsense. Of course you are. If the Spirit of God lives inside of you, he's always got something he wants to do through your life. Repent of that thinking that this is time to coast. It's time to just settle and be an attender rather than a participant. Lord, we want to be part of your plan for your world until Jesus returns. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Baptize us afresh with the spirit of God. Fill us again, Lord, with you. All of us, myself included, we've wasted too much time. In some cases, we've wasted a lot of time. May that not be the case any longer. May we do what the Bible says and redeem the time. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. But we can't do it ourselves. We need you. We need you. Can you say that to the Lord right now? I need you, Lord. You're everything. I need you, Lord. You have what I need, Lord. I have nothing you need, Lord, but you have everything I need. Oh, fill us, Lord. And if you've not yet said yes to Jesus, you need to know this, he died on the cross to pay for every sin that you have ever or ever will commit. He paid for it. And he offers to you a free gift of eternal life. But you have to receive the gift, you have to believe the gospel, that he did die for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he did rise from the dead according to the scriptures on the third day. You need to believe that and ask him to come into your life. And if you receive the gift, the Bible says he will give you the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. That's what the Bible says. You can make that decision right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I am a sinner, that's, that's clear, but I need forgiveness and I need a new direction. I need to be born from, from above. I need to be born, not just the birth from my mother's womb, but a spiritual birth. I need a spiritual birth. I accept you, Lord. If you're making that decision right now, if you're praying that right now, make sure somebody knows that what you've prayed Make sure you come up front afterwards, talk to me, talk to one of the pastors that will be up here, one of the elders. Let them know what you just prayed, that you decided today to receive Jesus. You know he's been calling you and now you've said yes. Thank you, Lord, for this time we've had together. We love you, Lord. We don't deserve anything you've given us, but we're thankful for everything. 
In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Let's worship.